This module will cover basic common clinical problems encountered in amphibian medicine and their treatments or preventions. The module has been split into two separate presentations. The first will cover bacterial diseases and idiopathic syndromes. The second part will cover nutritional disorders and supportive care. Both presentations are oriented mainly towards anurins, but many problems occur in all amphibians. This module is intended for veterinarians. While the information may help to educate non-medical personnel about the purposes of various procedures, the practice of veterinary medicine and the performance of the techniques described should be reserved for licensed veterinarians only. It should also be noted that all of the photographs in the presentation were obtained during routine clinical procedures as veterinarians were caring for ill amphibians. Before discussing specific problems and syndromes, it is important to recognize that stress is a major predisposing cause of illness and disease in amphibians. The acute stress response is a normal physiologic process that enables animals to respond to new and challenging situations. However, chronic stress leads to immunosuppression and other physiologic changes. The most common cause of chronic stress in amphibians is inappropriate husbandry or environmental conditions. So with all of the conditions discussed in this module, husbandry parameters should be reviewed and improved in conjunction with specific disease treatments as optimal husbandry will lead to healthier amphibians. Some common sources of chronic stress for amphibians include offensive odors such as predators sharing the same water source, cleaning agent residues or cigarette smoke, vibrations such as those produced by air stone pumps or other equipment, excess lighting, inappropriate substrate pH, cage mates and social stressors are particularly important to closely evaluate as behavioral cues indicating a problem may be subtle. And visual contact with predators or competitors, even if they are not in the same enclosure, can lead to chronic stress. The common conditions and diseases reviewed in part one of this module will include bacterial disease and syndromes including sepsis and mycobacteriosis. Note that chytrid disease and rhinovirus infections are covered in a separate module. Also included in this module are idiopathic syndromes including ulcers and abscesses, spindly leg syndrome, edema, and cloacal prolapse. Sepsis is commonly diagnosed in frogs. The colloquial term for the condition is red leg, as many animals become hyperemic on the ventrum and ventral legs. There are many different causes of both ventral hyperemia and sepsis, including viral, bacterial, and chemical etiologies, and often the infections are secondary to immunosuppression. However, the common classic presentation is due to septicemia from gram-negative rods, including Aeromonas species. In addition to ventral hyperemia, ulcers, edema, hemorrhage, and ocular lesions may be seen. In addition to correcting underlying causes of chronic stress, the treatment involves supportive care and systemic antibiotics. Fluoroquinolones such as enrofloxacin, chloramphenicol, and aminoglycosides such as amikacin are often good empiric choices. Mycobacterial infections are also commonly seen. They can be caused by a number of different aquatic mycobacterial species and cause nodular lesions both internally and externally. This again is often a disease seen secondary to immunosuppression. Unfortunately, there is no successful treatment and so identifying and eliminating the cause of the primary immunosuppression is key to prevention. Be aware that this disease is zoonotic. It tends to cause cutaneous nodules in people, often called fish handler's disease, and is difficult to treat. So gloves should always be worn when handling amphibians. Ulcers and abscesses are fairly common. They often result from trauma, which can be from cage-mate aggression or due to environmental factors such as inappropriate substrate or rubbing or banging against the cage walls. General treatment includes keeping the lesions clean and applying topical treatments. Triple antibiotic ointment or silver sulfadiazine cream are good empirical choices. Often, if one is not working, the other one will. Topical drops using an antibacterial ophthalmic preparation may also be used, but caution should be used to not overdose small patients. 
Systemic antibiotics may also be warranted depending on the severity of the lesions. Often, an impression of the lesion can help direct the most appropriate treatment. See the Clinical Techniques module for more details about these procedures. Note that care should be taken when applying treatments as a bath when amphibians have damaged skin. Animals in this state are less able to regulate their fluid balance and edema may result with too much bathing. Rostral lesions should be treated as above, but the husbandry will also need to be adjusted to stop the behavior causing the lesion. Spindly leg syndrome is a result of improper metamorphosis leading to musculoskeletal deformities. It is often not clear what specific cause led to the malformations. A number of different possible causes include dietary or vitamin deficiencies in either the diet fed the tadpoles or to the adults prior to laying the eggs. Inbreeding may be a factor, and various toxins, chemicals, or low dissolved oxygen may also play a role. It is not possible to correct deformities that have already occurred, and often these animals should be humanely euthanized. Prevention is the appropriate response to this syndrome, but may require a trial and error approach to larval rearing in order to find the underlying cause in each specific case. Edema may occur in the Saloma cavity, the sub-Q space in frogs, or both. There are many causes for this syndrome, including bacterial infections, liver or kidney disease or failure, skin disease leading to the inability to regulate their fluid balance, or nutritional causes of hypocalcemia and metabolic bone disease. Treatment can be attempted and should focus on addressing the underlying cause. Often, antibiotics may be used. Furosemide and baths in hypertonic amphibian ringer solution can also be effective to treat the edema in the short term, but it often returns if the underlying cause is not identified and addressed. Various structures can prolapse from the vent, including the cloaca, the rectum, the bladder, or reproductive organs. Once prolapsed, the animal may be seen straining, but probably was straining prior to the prolapse for some cause. Possible predisposing factors for prolapse include hypocalcemia, gastrointestinal impaction, GI parasites, or possibly toxins. Treatment of acute prolapses that have healthy appearing tissue exposed begins with cleaning the exposed tissues well, lubricating, and rehydrating the tissue. Hypertonic solutions such as hypertonic ARS or a concentrated sugar solution may help to shrink the tissues. The tissue should be replaced within the cloaca and a cloacal suture placed to hold the tissue in place as it heals. The sutures can be removed in a few days. Here you can see pink, healthy tissue after it has been cleaned. Small, lubricated, cotton-tipped applicators can be very useful in replacing the tissue. In this case, a single simple suture is placed to hold the cloaca mostly closed, but still allowing some opening for urates and feces to pass. This suture was removed in two days and the prolapse did not recur. It is important, however, to look for and address any underlying cause or the prolapse will likely return. Deworming is often indicated as a high parasite burden is a common cause for straining and prolapse. A number of useful references and resources regarding amphibian medical problems are listed here. Additional resources can be found at the Amphibian ARC website. That concludes part one of this module. Please continue on to view part two covering nutrition, nutritional disorders, and general supportive care guidelines.